Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Nature Hour. This is our second installment of our virtual lecture series, and we are so happy you have decided to spend the next hour with us. My name is Fritz Schroeder. I am the Vice President of Lancaster Conservancy's Community Impact Department, and we've launched, launched this series with the goal of bringing an assortment of local and regional experts to your home with presentations that help you better understand the Conservancy's work. Like this evening's pr presentation, Lancaster Wildlife Project, our goal is to inspire, educate, and move people toward action. This is a series of lectures that will be taking place every other Wednesday evening from 6 to 7 p.m. through the end of July. In the coming weeks, you'll have the opportunity to learn about building plant diversity in your backyard, measures to control spotted lanternfly, and healing yourself through native plants. We will share all the details at the end of this evening's presentation, you will also find them on our website, lancasterconservancy.org under upcoming events. We encourage you to pre-register. The format of Nature Hour is a 40 minute presentation followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. If you have questions, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, uh, as Kelly mentioned, uh, and we'll do our best to have them answered at the end of the presentation. And tonight I'm joined by my two incredible colleagues from our community impact department. We have Kelly Snavely, who's our director of marketing and communications, who you've met, and Faith DeJong, our development and annual fund coordinator. We're also very excited to have Lancaster Conservancy's president, Phil Wanger, with us this evening. And I would like to invite Phil to say a few words. Thank you for joining us for this Nature Hour. This virtual format is an exciting way to hang with our friends and learn about nature at the same time. Last week, for those of you who joined us, you know, we looked at the abundant life that lives under the water. And tonight, we're gonna go on the wild side and we're gonna explore all those creatures that come out at night and hide from view from us in many cases. The Lancaster Conservancy obviously has been protecting natural lands for 50 years. You know, we manage 47 nature preserves, one within every 10 miles of every resident. The acreage we own adds up to over 10 square miles in various parcels all along the Susquehanna and Conestoga rivers. We are in every corner of Lancaster County. Now, many of you like us and many of our supporters come out because they like trees, trees that store carbon and provide shade or that give us deer to hunt or fish to catch. Others come to the Conservancy because they love the relaxation of hiking and the quiet we feel when we escape into the forest or bathe in its beauty. But what inspires me the most is protecting the habitat. Today, I was with my 102 year old father. In his lifetime, our population has gone from 1.7 billion dot people to 7.8 billion people. We are losing our wildlife and biodiversity of this planet at an astonishing rate as population growth is destroying this planet. Our board believes very passionately that now's the time we must, must, must fight back. We must protect habitat, even if it's just saving remnant tracts of forest and stream corridors. Now the creatures you're gonna see tonight need our help to survive and to thrive. I know we have many fans here who understand that our suburban and suburban landscapes are monocultures of lawn, pavement, and bright lights. But my own experience is if you go into the woods at night, the first thing you see is the lack of light pollution, and the second thing you hear is the amazing sound of animals, this rich world filled with shy creatures that tend to avoid humans, and this is what we're protecting. So I'm excited to listen to Dan and to learn with all of you tonight, and let's have fun on the wild side of Lancaster. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Phil. The Conservancy is blessed with incredible corporate support. And tonight we wanna to recognize Turkey Hill Dairy, who is our presenting sponsor for Lancaster Water Week, taking place this coming August 7 through 15, and Clark Associates, our lead annual sponsor. Thank you to Turkey Hill Dairy and Clark Associates for your support of the Lancaster Conservancy and our natural lands. And now I would like to introduce Dan Ardia. Dan Ardia is a professor of biology at Franklin and Marshall College. His primary research interest is understanding how organisms interact with their environment in response to rapid environmental change. Much of his research focuses on the physiology and behavior of birds across the world, including Africa, South America, 
and Alaska, but understanding home is equally important. So recently he started the Lancaster Wildlife Project to better integrate his local research projects. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dan Ardia. Hello everybody. It's uh, trying to share, uh oh, I need you to unshare. It's good to be here. It's really an honor to have the opportunity um, to come talk to you. And let's get this up here. Um, I just wanted to start by thanking the Conservancy, not just for the invitation to come speak with you today, but also uh, for the evolving partnership that uh, I've developed with them. And I look forward to uh, many more years of working together uh, to answer questions that are both of ecological, but also of conservation and of human interest. Um, so I'd like to talk to you today about this project that we've recently just branded to bring together a bunch of research projects um, to study, as Fritz said, our home place. Um, so I wanted to give you just a little bit of my arc as a researcher and how we sort of ended up in this project. So one of the reasons that I um, was driven to be a field biologist was not just a, a curiosity about how the world worked, but it also seemed like a great opportunity to see the world. And so um, I love to travel, but I also um, like to think about my local place. Um, and so consequently, it's important to, sorry, I have my timings on here and well, we'll work around it. Um, so as Fritz said, I work on uh, birds primarily, uh, studying them uh, all across the world, interested in how they respond to rapid environmental change. Um, and I've worked, had the opportunity to work with many, many students and colleagues over the years, um, but also very focused on studying the home environment. Um, and so what first got me started in this was noticing a lot of red foxes around campus and wondering what it was that allowed them uh, to thrive so well in human dominated environment. Um, so in collaboration uh, with my former student, Amalia Handler, who's shown here uh, rock climbing, this of course is not Lancaster. We were interested in what were some of the things that allowed foxes to handle this new environment from the one they'd involved in. Um, and I won't go into great detail about our methods, but we used a trick of how the chemistry of corn works differently than other foods. And corn shows up as high fructose corn syrup in a lot of human foods. And so we measured in the hair and stomach contents of foxes whether or not they were receiving a chemistry signature of corn and found indeed that foxes that live closer to urban development um, were eating more garbage. And that was a way that they had adapted to the human environment. But that got me thinking more about forest land. Um, and so what we have, I'm gonna show you three images from a recent report done by the state of Pennsylvania looking at forest cover. And so the maps are gonna show all of Pennsylvania here on the left. And then on the insert over here, you'll see Lancaster and York counties. And so first, if we look here at Lancaster, you can see that if the green is forest, there's very little forest in Lancaster County compared to many other counties. This shows the forests um, by their value for wildlife. And so the blue are what they call core forests. These are larger forest areas that are able to harbor um, a large number of species. And then as forests get smaller, they're given a, a yellow, a red, um, and then finally a gray color that indicates how well connected they are to other forests. So if we look over here in Lancaster County, you can see that most of the forests, including interestingly these forests down here in the Susquehanna Highlands, which would be many of the preserves you would think of when you think of the Conservancy, Taquan, Kelly's, House Rock, um, are all colored as gray, which means that they're actually not that well connected with each other. Um, only up here in the northern part of the county where Lancaster and Lebanon counties come together do we see true core forest. The third trend we see, if you look here, again the forest shown in green and in um, orange. The orange forests are those that are publicly owned and the green ones are those that are privately owned. That Lancaster has much of its forest cover in private hands, of course, in the hands of the Conservancy. And so we should all uh, show a debt of gratitude to them for being the main stewards of forest cover in Lancaster. So just to summarize then, what characterizes the forests that we find here in Lancaster County? 
Um, there aren't many of them. Those that are around are not very big, and the vast majority are in private but not public use. So here's another image. We're gonna look at a lot of maps tonight. Um, so here's Lancaster City, Route 30, um, going over here into York County. Uh, here are those lands up at the Lancaster-Lebanon border. Um, and you can see that there's a lot of people, and here are some of the blocks of forest. And so what I'd like to start is getting us to think a little bit about how the landscape is, has developed over time and how that landscape might look to the animals that live there. Um, so we could start first by looking at a place I'm sure all of you are familiar with, Tuckwan Glen. Um, and so here's just an aerial image and the points here are just arbitrary based on Google Earth. Um, and so you can, if we'll go back here and just look at it uh, in a little bit more detail, you can see that it varies in the type of forest you might see, um, but it's at least on the small scale, a relatively intact forest. If we expand out, we can see that it's surrounded by a matrix uh, of other kinds of forest or land covers. And so here's agriculture and residential areas. And then if we compare that, let's say to some smaller preserves here like Shiprock um, or Holly Point, that they're mostly surrounded by residential or agricultural areas and the size of the forest gets smaller. Um, Here's a bigger block, Welsh Mountain, some of you may be familiar with, one of the larger preserve areas that connects, of course, to Muddy Rocks uh, County Park here as well. Um, but even though it's a pretty big forest, it is surrounded on all sides by agriculture and by residential habitat. Um, and then the last sort of big block we'll talk about today is this ridge that runs uh, at the interface of Lancaster and Lebanon counties. And again, to get you to think about how an animal would perceive this landscape, you could imagine, let's say, a bear that uh, needs to leave its home and disperse and find where to live might move down from farther north, let's say up at Hawk Mountain, it hits this ridge and begins moving um, southwest. Um, the forest gets narrower and narrower until they're funneled, until eventually they hit 283. Boom. Now, so some animals might cross that. They still need to traverse more habitat, and eventually um, they end up, whoops, sorry, um, at the river. So another way to look at a landscape, sorry, my timings are off here, uh, is to look at it with land cover. And so we're gonna look at some maps that represent uh, the county in a series of these colored dots. And so these come from standard maps that are produced by the government and they use standard land cover categories um, that represent standard categorizations that other researchers can use as well. And so red will be levels of development and you can see of course the city, the Route 30 corridor over here in New York, uh, but also all the main pikes and roads out of the city. Uh, the yellow and brown refer to different kinds of agriculture, which of course, if you drive around, you can see, and then eventually we see these forest blocks. And each of the dots here represent places that cameras have been used in the past. And these kind of data come from what's called remote sensing, where uh, satellites pick up the reflection of various habitat or land cover types, each has a different kind of wavelength as it reflects back the sun's rays and are picked up by these satellites and produce these maps. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to my longtime collaborator on this project, Eric Lonsdorf, who's a lead scientist at the Natural Capital Project based at the University of Minnesota, although he lives here in Lancaster. Um, and he is a phenomenal spatial ecologist. And he hasn't had as much time to devote to the project over the last few years as he'd hoped, but he was around in the development of it um, and he's always available um, to participate. So let's think about how animals perceive the landscape. And we're gonna talk about different scale at which they would interact with the world around them. Um, so if we start here first at a spot, perhaps in Trout Run, um, and so you can see this is an image from Google Earth. Here would be the waterway and the upland. Um, and a fox, like the one we see here on the right, would experience its local environment uh, by looking for food, shelter, the right kinds of microclimate, temperature, whatever it might be. Um, and so it would first sort of how it interacted with the landscape would be a function of its position, whether it was down by the stream or let's say up on the upland. But of course, foxes move around over the course of their lives. They might disperse, they might be searching for mates. And so as they move around the landscape, they will encounter what surrounds that patch. And so in this case, if they go north or south, they would encounter more forest. But as they went east, they might encounter this open space here, or to the west, they would encounter this residential development. And so what surrounds that patch, its size and its shape, 
could really influence how the animal survives and reproduces. We can expand out even further, again, looking at trout run here. So there was the residential and the agricultural area we just looked at. And so a fox that knew where it's going could thread this space here, cross the road, go to Steinman, perhaps here across this road over to Ray's Woods. And so as we expand outward, the scale at which the animal interacts with its landscape differs. And how that patch, again, its shape, its size, what it's surrounded by can play a role. And so here just be another representation. You can sort of think of this on different levels of scale. And so an animal here would experience local conditions and moving out would experience different things. So we've developed kind of this very simple conceptual model to think about what might explain how animals interact with their environment. And so here would be on the inside, that local environment I talked about, factors such as the resources available, access to water or shelter, moving up to what we might call the patch level, the size and shape, what the edge, edge is a fancy term for sort of the interface between two different habitats. And so often classic edges would be a forest and an agricultural area, so going from closed to open. And then as we move out into the landscape level. Um, so part of what we're interested in, and I won't present much information about those analyses today, is to understand how these three factors work together to determine whether we see particular species and what determines their abundance. Because these factors are all interrelated, we have to do a lot of big statistical models to try to piece it together and it leads to somewhat unsatisfying results and that you can't pinpoint one single factor. Um, we just got in the fifth year of, of the data from this project this past spring, and so we're in the process of analyzing the last set of images and to, to do some final sets of statistical analyses and start writing some papers. But I do wanna to talk to you today about some of the preliminary results and then talk about where the project will go from here. Okay, so here is an image of all the preserves in which we have worked, and you can see they cover the, the vast majority of the Conservancy's uh, protected preserves. And so I'm gonna thank them multiple times throughout the talk, um, and I'm gonna thank them now for the opportunity to work at all these preserves. And in fact, since we started, new preserves have been added, and we've started working at those as well, such as Helen Hills and Conway Wetlands. Um, here's just another representation of those preserves. Uh, so here we're looking at not just Lancaster and York counties, but a whole bunch of them. Here's Harrisburg over here. Again, just focus for a second on the red. Those are urban or residential areas that are for all practical purposes developed. And so an animal moving through the landscape that comes, for example, from here down has to jump across these habitats in order to get from one forest to another. So our habitats are very fragmented here in Lancaster County. So how did we do this work? Well, the main uh, research I'm gonna talk about for this, with this forest preserve project comes from using these remote um, motion activated trail cameras, a very common technique used uh, by people interested in wildlife on their properties for hunters to figure out where to hunt. And they've also become an important tool in wildlife conservation. You've probably seen the commercial by Microsoft of how they used uh, artificial intelligence to categorize snow leopard photos. I will say we don't get any snow leopards and Microsoft has not yet called to offer us their AI technology. Um, but what we do is we go and we place these cameras in the field and many of you have seen them out in nature. And if you've seen them, it means we're not doing a very good job. Uh, I would say that students vary in their ability to place these cameras and sometimes they're in places that just smack you right in the face as you go by. But our best kinds of camera placements are the one like this here down low to pick up smaller animals and attempting to blend into the landscape. Um, it's important to put the caveat out there that they're only as good as the animals that walk by. And so they're not a perfect census or metric of what's out there. We try to place them in ways that are representative of the animals that are in the landscapes, but they're not perfect, just like any technique would be. So I want to give a shout out to the dozens of students that have worked with me on this project over the years. Um, this is just a handful of them. Um, this one group here over here on the right at Trout Run. Here's my favorite preserve, uh, House Rock. And this is my uh, dutiful field assistant, Thomas, my son. Uh, for many years ago, he's gotten taller and now he's become sort of like a teenager. He's less interested in going to the field with me. So. So I'm sure many of you are dying to see pictures from these cameras and here we're gonna go through some of them. So this is just a smattering of some of the photos that we get. And some of them are perfect like this one, a nice regal fox in the snow. Um, other times we get partial images like these three deer uh, hind ends. Um, we get a lot of night photos because animals are, as you heard, very active at night. 
And sometimes we get blurry images here, like this heron that goes by. So one general result that we see is that most species are found in most preserves. Those are the, not the kind of results that you would get if we were working, for example, in the Brazilian Amazon, where different patches might have different species diversity. But in our highly fragmented and human-influenced landscape, most things are found in most patches. So most preserves have deer and raccoons and opossums and fox, and usually a red fox. So what we often see differs is the abundance and not necessarily the species that we see, with some exceptions. Um, the species that we see, uh, a lot of are the red fox, and as I said, the red fox was one of the early motivating species from, for this project, and we see them in all kinds of places, and I'll talk a little bit more about what kinds of factors influence where we see foxes. Um, we see a lot of wild turkey, which is great, and they seem to love that interface of an edge between a forest that provides cover and places to raise young, but also to hop out into open fields in order to eat, for example, agricultural foods. We've managed to get a picture of one river otter over the years uh, from Trout Run. Uh, this was one of the best days of the project when a student called me in and said, what do you think this is? And um, of course, it was a river otter caught there by the stream. We have not yet um, seen it since, um, but it was a pretty exciting moment. Um, we get a lot of raccoons, although fewer than you would think. Uh, raccoons are the kind of species that likes to be in smaller patches or that are found close to agricultural areas for that mix of, of both shelter and food. And so bigger forests tend to have fewer raccoons. Um, we of course see many, many deer, and I'll talk a little bit more about deer in a second, uh, but they are our most abundant species um, across all sites and in terms of biomass as well. Um, we see opossum at quite a few sites, although again, like raccoons, they tend to like smaller, more disturbed sites, and at bigger blocks of forest, they tend not to be found deeper into the woods. Um, we, same thing is true for rabbits. Uh, rabbits will show up, um, again, in smaller forests closer to edges. We do see some coyotes. This is a, a combination of a bunch of images of a coyote from raised woods, um, clearly uh, trying to leave a scent mark. Uh, we pick up coyotes in a smattering of sites. Um, it, we don't have enough data um, to yet say uh, where they're finding themselves or how they're moving. And so one thing we're thinking about doing is setting up some scratch posts to try to get some fur from coyotes, both to look at some population genetics, but also to capture animals uh, in different ways than the cameras because coyotes might be avoiding getting their pictures taken. So let's look at some maps that show some of the data from this project. Uh, so we're gonna use this format through a bunch of these. I wanted to start first by orienting people to how the maps are made. Um, and so the dots refer uh, to each of the sites for which the data have been summarized. The size of the dot um, represents the number of individuals that are seen on average per day. And so, for example, one of these bigger circles means that at that site, on average, we see between 1.5 and 2 animals over a 24-hour period. Um, and then I just, to help people um, orient to some of the sites they might be familiar with, um, Here's Texter up here in the northeast part of the county. Here's Conroy Wetlands, um, Lancaster City, of course, and Windolph, Holly Point, and Griders here, uh, Welsh over here. And if we move down into the Susquehanna Highlands, you can see uh, Turkey Hill, um, House Rock, Kelly's Run, Steinman, just to help give you a sense for, for where the preserves are gonna be showing up on the map. Um, so now if we look at which sites tend to have the most animals, you can see that no clear pattern seems to pop out. Um, so some sites tend to have more than others. There's variation. But it's important to say that these, as I said, don't represent a census. So they're not an exact number of animals that are found, but rather they represent quirks in part of when we place the cameras and where we place the cameras. So we keep the cameras out for six to eight weeks and then rotate them across sites. And so some sites might only have been sampled, for example, twice and perhaps only in the fall and winter and those might have influenced sighting probabilities and consequently have a lower number compared to another site that which may have been sampled only in the spring or been had a particularly large number of individuals in part because some pass by the camera every night for a while. So these all need to be taken with some caveats, um, but some patterns do can be observed, which is that bigger patches tend not to have higher 
uh, citing probabilities. So if you look up here, for example, here's Randall Kettle Run, which is a large forest block, tends to have on average fewer sightings than, for example, Wind Off Landing or the Turkey Hill Trail. Now, another important caveat to keep in mind is that animals in small patches may pass by the camera more. So detection may represent not just the number of animals, but something about their behavior as well. Um, as I said, we were interested in testing a bunch of questions statistically about um, what animals were doing, and I'm only going to show you a couple of graphs. Uh, but this is one that demonstrates the pattern I mentioned earlier, which is that most things are found in most places. So on the x-axis here, we have an index of forest cover with higher numbers here, meaning less forest and more development, and negative numbers here, meaning more forest and less development. And then on the y-axis here is an index of biodiversity with one being the maximum number of total species that we've seen at the site and zero being that for that camera placement we recorded no species. So if you look at the blue line, you can see that there's a subtle trend that as forest cover decreases, the biodiversity decreases slightly, but there's so much variation so that any degree forest cover, there's wide variation in the number of species, which suggests that there's no strong effect of forest cover on the number of species. We can look at the story for some individual species. And so here uh, is our friend, the red fox again. Um, and so the circles here represent the probability of seeing animals. And so the most populous sites have on average a 0 0.6 to a 0.75 probability. So it means that up to 75% chance that a fox will be seen each trap night. Um, and you can see that there's wide variation, but that the sites closer to the city pick up a lot of foxes, which I'm sure many of you that live um, in the city or in the suburbs see a lot of foxes about. Um, and so I mentioned earlier that raccoons and opossums seem to like smaller patches. And so here are some data that support that. And so um, on the x-axis, we have the percent forest in the landscape. Each dot is a different site. And then on this axis, what we've done is lump together the three, what we call meso predators, meso, meso for middle. And so these would be red fox, opossum, and raccoon, which are sort of like middle-sized predators of some kind. Um, again, there's quite a bit of variation, and so it's important to look at the individual points. But in general, as the forest cover gets larger, so we get into bigger blocks of forest, we are picking up animals like raccoons, opossums, and red fox at a lower rate. People that are always interested in deer, in part because they're so visible, but also they might be interested in hunting them. Uh, so here we have data on deer. Uh, similar, by the way, probability scale as red fox, um, but much larger values here. So here, for example, um, this is the Turkey Hill Trail. Uh, we get a lot of deer there, but deer also closer to the city as well. Um, and again, similar to some of the other sites, these bigger blocks of forest um, have lower detection probabilities which again, don't necessarily mean that there's fewer animals, it just means we're picking them up at a lower rate. And so one interesting thing about deer is they show up at such a high level that we can look at how their behavior might change in response to people. And so here are some data um, from a project one of my students did this past year. Um, so first we can look at our daily detection probability um, for three different seasons of the year, the fall, the spring, and the winter. And you'll notice there's no summer because the cameras uh, spend their summers in different places. So for example, this summer, the cameras are either in Texas, working on a project on rattlesnake behavior, or in the Poconos, um, studying deer browse effects on ecosystem ecology. And so these are primarily used here during the academic year with f &M students. And so uh, one thing, if you look just at the seasonal trend is that there's a significant of a higher number of deer being detected in the fall, although you can, these little bars here are the error bar and there's quite a bit of error, so functionally these two are the same with each other. But even if deer did occur or were picked up more in the fall, it could be that they move more in part because they're being hunted or people are on the trails more. Um, the red here refers to locations in which hunting occurs and yellow, I mean uh, hunting doesn't occur in blue where hunting does occur. So what we're interested in is whether hunting behavior changed the behavior of deer. Um, and so here then now, though, these are the same data broken down by month. Um, and so January through April and then uh, September through December. And we mo focus mostly on these three months here where we saw the most hunting activity. And um, 
The blue refers to sites that allow hunting and the red to sites that don't. Um, and so what we were interested in is whether or not the presence of people and particularly hunters were causing deer to be more active at night. And so on the y-axis, we have the proportion of total deer activity that occurs at night. So this could scale from zero, meaning they're never active at night, to one, meaning they're always active at night. And so if we can compare these two sites, two, two types of sites at the same season, those that allow and those that don't allow hunting, you can see that on average, the deer are much more active at night at sites that allow hunting. Now, of course, it could be that the kinds of sites that we allow hunting are ones that have particularly different kind of deer. Um, we don't know whether that's the case. The hunting uh, policy for the different preserves represents, I'm sure, a lot of historical legacy as well as how safe it is to hunt at different sites, but it seems likely that deer are responding to the presence of hunters, or to put it another way, deer that fail to make good decisions in the presence of hunting activity are those that don't leave offspring to then make foolish decisions themselves. So the ones that persist are the ones that avoid getting killed and consequently they're more active at night when they have a lower probability of being shot. Another thing we pick up a lot on these cameras are cats. Now, I started this by saying that I'm an ornithologist, which means that free living cats, whether they be your beloved house cat or whether they be feral cats, either living on their own or fed by people, are a major effect on bird populations. Um, there's enormous amounts of empirical data that cats kill a lot of birds, whether they eat them or not, and even the fattest, slowest, dumbest house cat still kills birds. And so to us, it's a very important conservation issue to understand cats in the landscape. Um, and so here we see uh, the detection probability of cats. The first thing to say is we don't pick up a lot of cats, thank goodness. Um, but where we do see cats, they're closer to the city, they're closer to where there's suburbia, and this is House Rock down here, where the preserve is close to a number of houses, and cats wander into the preserves. Um, and so this gives us important conservation information to help with an education campaign so that people, especially people who live closer to nature preserves, are conscious of the effect that their cats might have on wild animals. When we started this project, we were hoping to not get pictures of people. Um, so we tried to set the cameras at first off the trail so that we wouldn't pick up pictures of people at all. So we started by setting up a, a study where we had paired cameras, one on the trail, and one off the trail, um, to see whether or not we would get animals that weren't on the trail so we wouldn't need to work on the trails. But it turns out animals, as you would expect, don't blunder uh, through the forest, through shrubs. Um, and they save energy by moving along trails. In fact, uh, most trails follow the natural flow of the landscape and represent natural deer paths. And so consequently, we found that our cameras off trail never really picked up animals, so we began working on the trail. And so what this gave us was a rich data set on how people are using these preserves. Um, so we have some preliminary information on recreation numbers, and I wanna start simply by saying to put a, a lot of caveats on these, in part because they represent, as I said, these seasonal biases. So these are data we just managed to get summarized this fall, and so we hope to then break them down to understand when people are going to preserves to better understand um, whether how to understand the absolute values that are here. But first thing you can see, not surprisingly, is that some preserves are visited much, much more than others. And so again, the size of a circle, represents the daily detection probability. And so that says that these sites on average pick up 10 to 12 people per day. Now it's important to remember that in pre-COVID times, uh, before the pandemic, from a Monday to Friday perspective, very few people were found out, even at Tuckwan Glen at 10 a.m. in the morning. Um, and so these numbers represent an average, which means that if we had a day where we never saw anybody, it meant that we might've seen 30 or 40 people on a weekend. The places that it's clear that people like to visit are Turkey Hill Trail, Conway Wetlands, and Kelly's Run. Um, the Tuck One numbers are a little bit lower than we uh, expected, and some of that is because these are grouped across site, and we often spread our Tuck One cameras across parts of the preserve that people don't generally visit. And so in order to provide useful information to the Conservancy, we're gonna break this down by camera, camera basis so that the parts of Tuck One that people do visit will certainly have levels of visitation that are similar. Um, to some of these other sites. We were also interested in how often people come to hunt. 
So we can't, of course, ask people as their pictures are taken whether they're there to hunt. So we use inference based on the image to determine whether we think someone's hunting. And I think that we would all agree that this person is heading out into the woods um, to begin or an end to hunt. And so we're able to generate information that looks like this. And so here we have the daily probability of picking up a hunter. The numbers are, are much less, uh, but it does show us that places like House Rock and the Turkey Hill Trail are, are very popular with hunters and that other sites, for example, like up here at Bel Air Woods, um, gets many fewer hunters. And if we look here, here's just a proportional representation of how much of the visitation at these sites is made up of people coming to hunt. Um, and you can see that some sites, of course, don't allow hunting, like Conoy, um, but others have, uh, even when hunting is common, that the majority of visitors to these sites are coming um, not to hunt, but just to recreate. Um, one interesting thing I'm sure that you've all heard and seen is that uh, people in this time of um, stay at home are flocking to preserves. This is a problem all over the country, but it's been, of course, particularly acute here in Lancaster. And you, of course, are familiar with the Tuck One Glen parking lot is now closed. So we uh, fortuitously had cameras at a number of sites that were very popular with visitors, including Tuck One, but also Kelly's Run. Um, and so we're in the process of processing those images to look to see um, how the numbers have gone up and the face of people flocking to these preserves and to see what effect that has on local wildlife. Um, we've also um, shifted a bunch of cameras into a monitoring program in collaboration with the stewardship group um, at the Conservancy. And so Brandon uh, chose the 15, uh, what he thought were the most important preserves to get year round monitoring. And so those have been placed in the field to get an assessment of visitation numbers um, moving forward, because that's a, a very important uh, management tool for the Conservancy. I wanna give a shout out to Aaron Haynes, who I know is watching, um, that as I move on now to next steps, that I'm um, expanding out this uh, circle of collaboration. I'll be working very closely with, with Aaron and Millersville students um, to try to answer a number of the questions that I'm gonna be bringing forward now as kind of the evolution of this project. So. Um, so what are the next steps? Uh, so one thing that's clear to me as I drive from Lancaster City through the landscape down to visit some of the preserves that we all love to hike at, like House Rock and Tuck One, is that there's a lot of small preserves or small forests that are not yet protected. And so I think a really important next step is to do what's called a gap analysis. And so gap analysis is a, a fancy name for a tool in conservation biology is to look for gaps, gaps in our protection. So you can imagine if you knew how a landscape was distributed, so you knew where all the forests were, you had an idea of where the animals were found, you knew what part of the landscape was protected, you could lay those on each other and look for places where there are important forests that are not yet preserved. And so if we go back to this image and look here at Lancaster City and look at little forest patches that might not be very big, but may for the purposes of wildlife play an important connective role um, we feel it's important to start identifying some of those sites. So if any of you out there listening um, own small forest plots that might be only a couple acres or 15 or 20, they would be interested in letting us come out and put up some of these cameras to survey your wildlife, please do contact me. I, I'd love to try to collaborate with you and get more information um, on a transect from Lancaster City out to some of these bigger preserves. And this just shows you here, if we follow the Conestoga River, out from Lancaster City, um, you can see that there are a number of places that the Conservancy protects, but a number of big, relatively speaking, forests that are still in private hands and not yet protected. Um, I'm gonna skip this in the interest of time. So the last piece I wanna talk about is this Lancaster Wildlife Project umbrella um, that has included a pivot to study more about Lancaster City itself. And I wanna give you a flavor of a couple research projects that we have going on um, in which some would be open for your participation. Um, so one thing my students and I did this year is we studied uh, urban bats. And so uh, we started using these uh, nifty little um, passive audio recorders called Audio Moth that are tuned to the frequency of bats. And so consequently, um, you can place these out and they'll pick up bat vocalizations and you can then offload the data and do an ID program to get a sense for what's out there in the landscape. Um, so we placed a bunch of these and had plans to place even more this spring, but we're unable to do that because of the pandemic. Um, so we're presenting some preliminary data. And I want to give the caveat that these um, come from this auto analysis program. And so it's likely that some of our detections overrepresent 
the probability of bats, but I'm gonna show you what the results were that we got. Um, so we found is there's a lot of bats that seem to live in and near the city. Um, and so here is at least the preliminary analyses pending um, more assessment of individual calls um, of the bats that we saw in the city or in and near the city and the size of the box represents the proportional abundance. So what this means is that this species here, that in 48% of the loggers we placed, um, we picked up at least one um, signal from that bat. And so what that allowed us to do is to look at which bats are active when. And so, um, so here, just look at the big brown bat over here on the left as an example. And so we broke our sampling up into um, mid-September through the end of October. And one would be that the animal was found, zero would be those locations where it wasn't. And then we, we fit a line to that that best fits the data that we find. And so you can see that early in the season, that big brown bats are very active and that as time goes on, the animals begin hibernating and that they disappear. Um, some bats we think come through, like this one here, through migration. We only pick it up very early and then it disappears. Um, so like I said, these are preliminary data. And so we're always looking for more sites. So if you would be interested in having bats sampled in your backyard, uh, please let me know. The last piece I wanna talk about is trying to understand how green spaces in the city are being used. Uh, so in partnership with Fritz, uh, who put me in touch with a number of people, including partnering now with the city itself. Um, we're interested in trying to understand how green space along the Conestoga River is used by both people and wildlife. And this, I think, is a particularly important question to study, not just because urban areas may harbor a lot of species, but a lot of people live in urban areas and there may be enormous socioeconomic disparity in our access to green space. So what we're gonna look on here on the left, is, here are the economic status of the census tracts that fall within the city of Lancaster from the 2010 census. And the green areas represent those that were considered the most economically depressed. And you can see that they all occur together in the southeast portion of the city. And then I've shown over here on the right, um, a map of Lancaster. And I'm gonna overlay those on top of each other. So again, here are those census districts. Um, and here then is the presence of the Conestoga River in a lot of these remnant green spaces. And so what we want to do is look at what green spaces are still available, how many of them are protected, and then how through outreach can we help people um, understand what green spaces are out there and how to get to them. And so outreach is really important. We were very excited to participate in Water Week this year, which of course has gone virtual. Um, so we look forward to being able to do outreach events in partnership with the Conservancy moving forward. Um, so just to sum up, I uh, appreciate your listening to our project. We've covered a lot of ground. Um, so this big thing now I'm calling the Lancaster Wildlife Project is really a combination of studying forest animals out there in the landscape, both natural species like the red fox, uh, invasive species that may be having an effect on wildlife like, like feral cats, um, how recreation plays a role, and also now understanding the urban environment more. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. And again, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Dan. We really appreciate that. That was just such an in-depth um, overview of your data as it's continuing to come in. And I know at the Conservancy, we're really excited to, you know, continue to learn and hear about your findings as you have the data come in from the fifth year um, of the projects. It, it's just incredible. Um, if you have any questions for Dan, we have a few moments to answer some here at the end of our presentation. Um, you can put those questions for him in the Q&A. I know a few of you put them in the chat and I'll make sure I try to find some of them there as well, but just put your questions for Dan in the Q&A and we'll get to them. Uh, while you're putting those questions there, I just wanna let you know about our upcoming nature hours. Next up, we have rebuilding biodiversity in your own backyard with Elise Jurgen. Uh, that'll be the first uh, day of July. Then we have Controlling Spotted Lanternfly, a very um, exciting and <laughs> issue I'm sure many people are familiar with right now as we're watching the nymphs. That'll be in the middle of July, July 15th. And then Nature's Medicine, Healing Yourself and the Earth with Native Plants with Megan Gonick, um, the Wednesday, July 29th. Um, so let's see here if we have any questions coming in for Dan. Um, so we have a question from Tim. He says, have you seen coyotes in the Otter Creek Gorge? If so, um, have they impacted the population of foxes? That is a great question. So we have uh, images of coyotes from Otter Creek. And I th one thing that, that really motivated me in the beginning was 
to try to see whether we could um, see a signal for as coyotes were moving farther south into Lancaster County, whether that would change the distribution of foxes. And I would say that um, that is likely to occur, but it's too early to say for sure, uh, in part because we um, aren't getting enough coyote sightings and also it would certainly take time for that to occur. But I think that trend is real. We know from many other places that bigger canids drive smaller canids away. And that part of what we thought would be interesting would be what would be a refuge for red foxes if coyotes were driving them out of other habitats, it would be the city. Um, so we should definitely all be vigilant for that because it could be a really interesting experiment going on right under our eyes. That's fascinating. Uh, we had an anonymous question. Are there volunteer opportunities for people who did not study in these fields but are interested in working with wildlife and the environment, citizen science? I mean, I, I don't, I, all I could say is that we would love to have you work with us. Um, so please do contact me. Uh, I think that, you know, as we have expanded this work that we're, rapidly exceeding our capacity to collect all the information ourselves and there's lots of things as I mentioned related to bats or people putting game cameras out themselves we'd like to to do more by having people sample wildlife in their backyard or measuring birds or whatever it might be and I think that the value of citizen science is critical in this moment to build a really important long-term data set and so um, we would love to partner with you. That's great and we'll make sure um, you share your email out um, in our uh, email with the recording after this so that if people want to get in touch with you, they, they can. Um, we have a question from Lisa. Have you ever considered the various cemeteries in Lancaster for your bat studies? Hi, Lisa. Um, yes, and I would say that eventually we'll get there, but we've been so um, overwhelmed by the number of people. As you know, we sent that email out to staff and faculty at f and and we have over 100 people that would like bat loggers. But in fact, cemeteries are a great natural habitat to put up game cameras. So I think one natural step to understand the urban environment more is to reach out to people who manage cemeteries to put up the cameras because we know from other studies that they're heavily used by wildlife, especially at night when people aren't there, so. We have a question from Julie in the chat. It says, um, is there any correlation between the number of visitors on a preserve and the number of wildlife on those preserves? So that's a great question, and that is exactly one of the things we're hoping to analyze over the next six months as we start um, getting the last bits of data in and then going through the process of proofing them all. Um, I would predict that the signal is more in activity rather than um, presence absence. And so as I showed you data for the deer that become more nocturnal, that we would predict that parts of preserves where people visit regularly, that animals avoid those during the day. And in fact, we're really, interested in looking at whether or not this pandemic pulse of people in the parks um, will be shifting wildlife to be more active at night or reuse different parts of the preserves because there's no doubt it's going to have an effect. Yeah, uh, Mauricio has a question. He says, I see that your focus has been mainly on animals. Um, do you have any colleagues that have been doing kind of similar studies um, around plants? I don't. Um, I mean, plant biologists feel like animal biologists get all the attention. I mean, it's not my fault that birds and mammals are cool. Um, that being said, we should be studying plants in more detail um, because not, I think that the value of these bigger preserves um, are in part for their value for plant biodiversity and probably also for birds and amphibians. And I think one thing that's clear is that the mammal diversity that's left in Lancaster County doesn't care a lot how big the forests are. And so your question makes me feel like we need to be pivoting much more to be thinking about things that do, like small mammals, amphibians, plants, insects, birds, those kinds of things. So thank you for asking it. Um, we had a question from Sarah uh, in relation to your um, concern with the cat populations. What is the most effective strategy for controlling feral cats? Um, well, my public answer would be that I think that education goes a long way. Um, I mean, everything I've read suggests that people that are feeding feral cats are really just extending the lifetime of cats that are generally not living very healthy lives. And so it, it seems like the best approaches are to try to reduce the size of feral cat colonies um, by either bringing animals in and help getting them adopted or, um, I mean, if people feel like they need to release them, these spay trap and neuter or neuter trap and release or whatever the order is, um, 
seem to be effective, but uh, I mean, the first step is to stop keeping colonies artificially around by feeding them, I think. Um, but you know, I, I feel like one kind of un, underestimated part of this is the value of having people keep their house cats indoors. Um, there was just a study that came out that tracked house cats and found that they moved very little, but that house cats killed an, a large number of, of animals. And as Aaron points out, I course being an ornithologist very focused on the birds but they're killing amphibians reptiles and lots of small mammals in fact they kill more small mammals than they do birds um, that they were having lots of localized effects but that if you build that across the scale of a neighborhood um, that people's pet cats can have a really important impact and so I would love to see us get to a point when you know like now no one would open their door and let their dog out to roam the neighborhood and cause trouble but yet we let our cats do that and so if we can get to a point where people view their cats as the same way they view their dogs, that letting cats out is a public nuisance, um, that we would change people's behavior and it would benefit wildlife. So. Well, thank you so much, um, Dan. Um, that I think is our last question, unless anyone else has one to pop into our um, question box here, into the chat. Um, I just wanna take a second again to thank you so much and just remind everyone that um, we do have several other upcoming nature hours um, and we also want to announce the dates of Lancaster Water Week, um, which you have mentioned that you're helping with um, in August with that study on the Conestoga River. Uh, we will be announcing the events on July 1st, um, which they will um, be mostly virtual at this point. And I wanna pass this back over to Fritz just to um, close us out here at the end. Thanks, Kelly. Appreciate you facilitating this evening and thank you, Dan, for the amazing presentation. Uh, and thank you everyone for attending and participating in these virtual lectures. Uh, Dan, I think of the Lancaster Wildlife Project, which uh, incidentally, if anyone is interested, the, uh, the URL is lancasterwildlife.org, lancasterwildlife.org, where you can go and learn about all the research uh, and especially as they update it. Uh, but what's presented here is really the continuation and a formalization of a relationship between FNM and Millersville University and the Lancaster Conservancy. And that's really what excites us the most. There is so much opportunity for us to collaborate and learn. And this is in many ways a very beginning step five years in of presenting this information. And there's so much more to come and so much more for us to learn. A question that I heard uh, Dan ask was, um, how does an animal move through the landscapes? And he talked about fragmented landscapes. So how does an animal move or how do animals move through these highly fragmented landscapes, which is something that we're constantly talking about with the Conservancy. How do we connect these landscapes? How do we connect these fragmented landscapes? How do we protect more of that natural land and then restore it to make it not only hospitable for you and I as human beings to go and explore, but also for these animals uh, and the necessary balance that, that uh, we need to strike there. Uh, and um, someone brought up the citizen science component of how they could get involved. And I think it's worthwhile to mention that the Lancaster Conservancy is uh, formalizing a volunteer land steward program that will be released uh, announcing later this summer where we're looking for more folks to get involved uh, and we would be more than happy to connect you with uh, work that's happening on our preserves but also research projects that are happening around our streams and rivers there's a community wildlife habitat uh, movement uh, and then of course what Dan and his group are doing there's a lot happening around citizen science and we'd be very happy to be a connector to getting you more information about that which brings me to our event in two weeks, which is focused on urban ecology, something that Dan touched on at the very, very end, and that should be very um, meaningful to all of us, which is rebuilding biodiversity in our own backyard. So not only thinking about these incredible landscapes that we've been protecting for 50 years, but now what can we do in our own neighborhoods and communities? Uh, and that, fe that features Elise Jurgen, who's well known in our community, who recently just started Waxwing EcoWorks. She's a, a local a biology teacher that's now on her own and an incredible uh, local leader and, um, and has been involved with our Community Wildlife Habitat Initiative. And we're so excited to be presenting that in two weeks. Uh, and we hope you'll join us here again, uh, two weeks from today to uh, continue this learning process. So with that, uh, we're gonna end our session, but I just want, once again wanna thank Dan for his amazing work and thank you all for joining us. And we'll look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Have a wonderful evening.